Established in 1959, PRIO takes pride in being one of the world's oldest institutions of peace research. More importantly, we also aim to be one of the best. Ultimately, PRIO's research should contribute to a future where peace is the norm and violence is the exception. What is the role of nonviolence in the struggle for liberation? Is it possible for humankind to lay down the burden of war, the burden of conflict, and move toward a different way, a better way? If you want war, you prepare for war. If you want peace, you actually do start diverting some of the resources that you put into the military toward the needs of the people. I will say that I really do believe sustainable peace is possible. When we all finally recognize that constantly going to war does nothing but make more war ultimately. The problem with global ideologies is that when it's yours, it's hugely seductive. So the result of these ideologies has not been to produce globalized identities, it's to produce fractured identities within countries. Hi, I'm John Mueller. I'm delighted and honored to be giving PRIO's annual peace address this year in Oslo. Politicians, bureaucrats, the media, it's very much in their interest to basically keep the uh, the fear level's high. The chance of being killed by a terrorist under concurrent cir circumstances are incredibly low, like one in 80,000 if you live to be 80. What I'd like to assess is the issue of threat and threat perception. In international relations, I think it's extremely important to get the threats right. PRIO is an ideal place to try to explore and present these ideas. I very much look forward to seeing you there and having a lively discussion. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Peace Research Institute Oslo and to the 2015 PRIO Annual Peace Address. My name is Christian Berg Harpviken. I am the director of PRIO and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to tonight's event, the sixth of its kind. We are glad, indeed honored, to uh, see so many of you here tonight, to have such a mixed audience, representatives from the government, working on policy, practitioners, civil society representatives, prominent academics, not all, although many, from PRIO. As peace researchers, we work with uh, difficult issues. We strive to address how conflicts can be resolved, how violence can be prevented, how lasting peace can be achieved, how it is that violence affects real people, how it is that uh, societies cope. These are fundamental questions in our field and they are by no means easy to answer. For over 50 years, peace researchers and PRIO have worked on these issues. Yet, it is important to remain important to new impressions and to fresh ideas. The PRIO annual peace address is meant to make us think differently about issues, to ensure that we remain aware, humble and open to other views, to inspire us, to further strengthen our competence in the field of peace research. Our guest tonight is Professor John Miller from Ohio State University. He's a highly merited researcher. He's uh, also, besides his affiliation, his job at uh, the Ohio State University, a senior fellow at uh, the Cato Institute, and relevant in this context, a former guest researcher at uh, the Nobel Institute up the street. 
The topic of this year's Prio Annual Peace Address is the dangers of alarmism. Miller has dedicated much of his career to this topic, looking at international security threats, looking at the fear that they instill in our societies, looking at what it is that we do to try to cope with these threats. From the Cold War to the War on Terror, from rogue states to nuclear weapons. But, asks Miller, how big are these threats? To what extent do we, should we, allow them to affect us? Are our responses adequate? Are our responses commensurate with the threat? Uh, without any further ado, I'll uh, give the floor to uh, John Miller. Please, the dangers of alarmism, please. Thank, thanks very much. Very great to be here. Um, as the guy in the video who had a beard um, said, um, the, what I'm particularly interested in is dealing with the issue of threat. It's really underappreciated, I think, in international relations uh, because people talk about balancing threat, but less about how do people come to believe that they're actually being threatened. Um, and my point of view basically is that, uh, at least since World War II, Almost every threat that has sort of risen to a clear level has then been unwisely exaggerated, and it's inflicted sometimes enormous cost of, of, uh, of, of overreaction. Uh, and that's one of the main things I'd like to talk about uh, now. Uh, the the uh, book, um, um, this book will be coming out later this year called Chasing Ghosts. Um, and it deals with the uh, uh, effect of terrorism and trying to deal with the threat. And it follows in a book we did somewhat earlier, the same my co-author Mark Stewart and I, called Terror, Security, and Money. Um, the picture on the right we really wanted to have on the cover. Uh, as you can see, they did get a few barbed wire things there. Uh, but it's sort of typical for the, the terrorism sort of thing. They have layers and layers and layers of, of security, ending with a dog and a man with a gun on the other side of uh, miscellaneous uh, um, uh, uh, barriers. Um, the, the issue here basically is I don't want to say that exaggerating a threat or being alarmist is necessarily always a bad thing. Uh, sometimes uh, you want to be more alarmed than you are. And a particular case of that would be Adolf Hitler during World War in the 1930s. Uh, quite clearly in that case, the, there was not enough alarm. Uh, Hitler himself, by the way, uh, worked very assiduously to, to not have the alarm. Uh, and so in every one of his foreign policy speeches uh, during uh, uh, the 30s, he explained uh, that uh, these are the page references. There won't be an exam afterwards. Uh, <laughs> But these are the pages on which he pointed point out how really, really deep down inside he wanted peace. And he was trying basically not to cause people to have alarm. Um, so sometimes it makes a lot of uh, sense uh, to uh, uh, be alarmed. Uh, but it seems to me, at least since World War II, essentially what happened is that lesson has been overlearned. Uh, Robert Jervis, a political scientist at uh, Columbia, uh, says those who remember the past are condemned to making the opposite mistakes. And I think we've been seeing too many Hitlers in too many places uh, since, uh, since World War II. So what I'd like to do is to uh, basically talk about terrorism in particular and how much the danger it, it uh, presents. Uh, but I'd also like to do a little bit to compare it with alarmism during the, second, during the Cold War, which I think was also exaggerated um, at, at a considerable cost. Um, so let me talk about that first, br rather briefly, and then uh, about uh, terrorism in the United States. Uh, it, essentially, in the first part of the post-war period, they were sort of a, trying to figure out how dangerous communists were, particularly from a military standpoint. And with the Korean War in 1950, Harry Truman came to this conclusion that he somehow felt certain, he felt certain, uh, that uh, South Korea was allowed to fall to communist hands. You can see the rest uh, being a Third World War, just like the Second World War. Now, he was right to be alarmed in many respects, to be, but to be certain about the alarm is rather bizarre. And this is from a, a quote from uh, a book recently by John Lewis Gaddis, who has talked quite frequently at, um, in, in, in Oslo, uh, his biography of George Kennan. Uh, and he's looking back at that period, 1950, when the Korean War is just beginning. Um, and uh, he says, uh, who would have anticipated in 1950 that there'd be no world wars? Uh, that the United States and the Soviet Union, soon to have tens of thousands of thermonuclear weapons pointed at one another, would agree tacitly not to use them. 
Um, and he says, there, the answer obviously that no one did. And, the, and his, his later statement is really bizarre in many respects. Uh, even much in, from what you knew in 1950, it was certainly plausible that the United, the United States, and the West and the East, and the Soviet Union in particular, uh, would not get into a major war like they'd just gone through. Both those, everybody that was living at that time, uh, the time, the victors, had tried to prevent World War II and was forced upon them. They found it was even worse than the war that they really hated previously, namely World War I. It was also the case that Soviet um, doctrine certainly did not involve any uh, Hitlerian idea of taking over the world in a direct military sense, but it was rather focused on violence in terms of revolutions and class warfare. So even what they knew then, it was not, you could argue that this, we could basically have this uh, stable peace at the top level, though there'd be a lot of conflict in the Cold War below that. So it seems to me basically that they, it's absolutely absurd that everyone should think this. So my point is not that they were wrong to think that, but they were wrong to not think about other alternatives. Uh, in other words, going to the completely alarmist perspective. Um, and um, the, um, also, uh, it, we found out lately, uh, as the archives have opened up, Robert Jervis again, that there was basically no indication the Soviet Union ever in a million years, a billion years, wanted to get into anything that would look like World War II again, with or without nuclear weapons. And uh, Wojciech Mostny has basically found the same thing going through the Soviet archives that have now become much more available. Now the consequence of this, the dangers of alarmism, this kind of alarmism that uh, everybody believed in 1950, have really been very considerable. Just to give you one example, uh, in order to deter the Soviet Union, which did not have to be deterred from that, from a, a, a starting World War III, uh, the United States uh, spent somewhere between five and ten trillion dollars. That was back in the days when you could really buy something for a trillion dollars. Um, uh, about a trillion dollars trying to um, deter the Soviet Union from something it didn't have to be deterred from. Uh, someone has calculated that ten trillion dollars at the time could purchase everything in the United States except for the land. The, the, the efforts on nuclear weapons and nuclear technology and re, you know, being able to survive an attack and so forth were incredibly costly, $10 trillion. Um, and it, it would buy everything. Or if you take the lower estimate, about $5 trillion, uh, that would, you, with that money you could buy half of everything in the United States except for the land. So that was a fantastic ex, uh, expenditure for doing something that was basically not necessary and virtually no one was talking about that. The other Cold War example um, was uh, the concern, particularly in the United States, about uh, domestic communists. And this is a statement from J. Edgar Hoover, who was uh, very uh, prominent in, in stoking and, and in exacerbating and increasing this threat. Uh, the American Communist Party is working day and night to further the communist plot in America with deadly seriousness. A Bolshevik transfer, transmission is in progress that is virtually invisible to the non-communist eye. Uh, unhampered by time, distance, and illegality. Communist puppets are being created throughout the country. The objective is to the ultimate seizure of power in, the, in America. Um, and uh, what's impressive about that, among various things, and this is a common sort of thing, this is the director of the FBI uh, saying that, Federal Bureau of Investigation, that you can't see it. Only the communists can see it. I can't see it, no one else can see it. Uh, and we have to really work out for it. Now, there was obvious uh, reasons, particularly after the, early the late 1940s and early 1950s, why you might be concerned about this basic issue. Uh, but to give some indication of the, of the problem, uh, essentially, no one, no one literally ever said this. There's an alternative hypothesis. Many domestic communists adhere to a foreign ideology that is ultimately has its goal of the destruction of capitalism and democracy and by force if necessary. However, they, the Communist Party in the United States does not present much of a danger or actually quite a pathetic bunch and couldn't subvert their way out of a wet paper bag. Uh, why are we expending so much time, effort, and treasure on this? Now, I think this, my, I would argue this is basically true. But I've asked about 30 historians of the period, did anybody ever advance this hypothesis? Uh, it, maybe it's wrong. I mean, you could argue it, obviously. But essentially, nobody is able to tell me, show me somebody, a professor, a pundit, a, pu a public official, who basically said this out loud and publicly during that period of time. And, it, and uh, this hypothesis, like the one that the Soviet Union is not going to attack, obviously proved to be pretty much true, I think. 
Um, so th keep those in mind as we go into the next uh, issue, which is basically uh, the question of terrorism, because some of that will come back. Um, the, um, so let me talk now about post-Cold War, uh, post-alarmism uh, about 9-11, in particularly in the United States, but it infects other places, and I'd deal a bit with Europe and also with the rise of ISIS and so forth, where I think this is, alarmism is, is basically continuing. Uh, this is Rudy Giuliani, um, the, uh, talking in 2005, who was the mayor of New York at the time of 9-11. Anybody, any one of these security experts, including myself, would have told you on September 11, 2001, that we're looking at dozens and dozens of multi-years of attacks like this. Um, now, um, th th there might be another attack, another big attack, or even several attacks is certainly a p possibility, and you surely want to take it into consideration. But that everybody uh, would have told you that it was happening is like the issue from 1950, namely everybody, everybody apparently agreeing that the Soviet we will, that World War III is inevitable. Uh, and let me put more flesh on this. Um, this is uh, two statements by recent, in recent books. Uh, the first is by George Bush in, uh, in his, in his uh, uh, memoirs from the presidency. Uh, talking about um, the, uh, 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 his time in office, of course. Uh, and early on, after 9-11, the FBI director came in and said, there are 331 potential al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States. Uh, the second statement is by a, a prominent member of the CIA, now recently retired. There was an avalanche, literally thousands of intelligence reports in the months following 9-11 that strongly indicated that al-Qaeda would hit us again. And some of those indicated that the terrorists might use chemical, biological weapons, or even crude nuclear devices. Um, now, what they, they, they state these statements, and you'd think that Bush would say, wait a minute, none of those 331 people ever showed up. It doesn't occur to him, even 10 years later, that maybe he ought to evaluate this number. He just spins it out. Nor does Morell, in his book, uh, say that all those thousands and thousands of reports were wrong. And he doesn't even, you know, he just, he just reports it as, as sort of gospel. Now, what's happened, and uh, the, um, the, uh, the terrorism became the sort of key issue uh, and motivating factor in this alarmist um, situation. I mean, clearly the two statements I just had before are very alarming, the 331 or more, uh, and that you get these thousands of reports. Even though they're all wrong, they were obviously alarming when they came in, and that mentality very much uh, continued. Uh, George Bush, um, for example, uh, made a speech in, at the end of 2003 in which he was asking for something like $87 billion to continue the war in Iraq, which was impelled by 9-11, effectively. Um, and I, I downloaded the whole speech, <coughs> and I cut out all the irrelevant words, and this is basically what you're left with. Uh, $87 billion, right? Uh, so th there was that sort of mentality that we're, they were really, you know, we're, we're really in big trouble. Let me add more on that. Um, this will give you some idea. It, this is uh, stuff coming out of the Chasing Ghosts book in particular. By 2009, there have been 1,000 federal government organizations and private companies dealing with it. There are over, over 17,000 locations in the United States. 263 were created or organized after 9-11. Uh, listing, simply listing the groups takes 300 pages, um, and the apparatus had uh, launched far more covert operations in the aftermath of 9-11 than all the covert operations together during the whole Cold War. Um, so this is a massive reaction to this threat uh, that mostly uh, seems not to have been there. I'll give you one example, the 263, the total number of terrorists who have been caught uh, or apprehended in the United States is about 100 since 9-11. That means that two or three whole organizations were created for every terrorist apprehension that has been made of people planning to uh, damage within the United States. Uh, give you, uh, and the, the numbers gets, just keep piling on. Um, by 2002, uh, intelligence people uh, were telling um, uh, uh, well-known reporters that al-Qaeda operatives trained in Afghanistan and elsewhere were currently in the United States at between 2,000 and 5,000. There are about two, two to 5,000 of them in the United States. Uh, the correct number, now that we have a lot more information, is that conceivably it might be four. So they're off by a factor of 1,000 or so. Um, and so the question is, how could they possibly see these people they're very good at counting the people, but they couldn't find them. 
Um, and uh, that basically has, has substantially continued in this, this uh, incredibly alarmist uh, atmosphere. Um, a book I've used uh, quite extensively is a book called The Threat Matrix by uh, American journalist uh, Garrett Graff. Um, and he's, he talks extensively about um, the, uh, the effect of this. What happens is that these kinds of rumors and tips, which they, they don't call them rumors, they don't call them leads, they don't call them tips, they call them threats, are put together in this big spreadsheet, which every day is gone through by the heads of the FBI, the heads of the CIA, and the president. Um, and uh, it's the 9-11 commission syndrome is that every lead has to be followed up, no counterterrorism lead goes uncovered. It's a lead you don't take seriously becomes the next 9-11, that mentality. So all the unfolding plots and intelligence rumors filled with whispers, anything, because everybody's afraid that if you've got a tip, and even though it's obviously nonsense, if you don't put it in and something comes out of it, you're in big trouble. That, um, and uh, so, that, so what happens is every day, the uh, leadership in the United States has been looking at this massive number of, of threats that uh, keeps, these keep coming. Um, overall, as it points out at the bottom, the government has been following up uh, 5,000 threats per day. In other words, the United States, uh, since 9-11, has been look following over 10 million leads. The number of those who have, of leads that have led to anything at all, even fairly trivial things, but nonetheless something substantive, is uh, probably one in a, a 10,000 or one in 100,000. And most of the time when it leads to something, it's not very impressive. Uh, Graph then uh, does provide one element in the threat matrix. So uh, it's not published, needless to say, but he was able to get one. Um, the threat matrix says, there's a threat from the Philippines to attack the United States unless blackmail money is paid. Um, now, what's that based on is one single email. And the single email is this. Uh, Dear America, I will attack you if you don't pay me $9999. Uh, moo ha ha ha. Uh, <laughs> So they, th this is obviously written by some nutcase uh, in the Philippines. Uh, turns out it was a very young nutcase. Um, and so they, but they followed it up, uh, and they reported to the Philippine police. And the Philippine police went out and had a nice heart-to-heart -heart talk with the extortionist parents. Uh, as far as I know, he has not been heard from since. Um, so, um, so they did some good, I guess, shut this kid up. Um, but anyway, you get thousands of these things. And let me give you the impact. Jack Goldsmith is a really good man from this because he was basically a Republican. He was used to the, the atmosphere in some respects, but he was not there at 9-11. He came in two or three years later and worked in the Justice Department for a while. He's now a professor at, um, in law at Harvard. And he really shows, it seems to me, what, what this, this can do to people. Um, he's, the way he puts it, and there's other people saying the same thing, uh, it's hard to overstate the impact that the incessant waves of threat reports have on the judgment of people inside the government branch who are responsible for protecting American lives. Um, the, uh, and he quotes George Tennant, the head of the CIA, who says in his book, At the Center of the Storm, I prefer to call it At the Center of the Teapot, but at any rate, um, he's, uh, uh, he, he, at one point he says, every day you would hear something about a possible impending threat that would drive you, uh, to scare you to death. And what, what Goldsmith says, that captures the attitude of every person I knew who regularly read the threat matrix. So you get this compounding on things. Every single day you're coming in, and it has this big psychological effect. I can give you much examples of this, but I'll just leave you a f give you a few. Uh, one guy who read it all the time said, it's like being in, uh, stuck in a room listening to loud Led Zeppelin music. Uh, after a while, you become suffering from sensory overload and become paranoid about the threat. Um, another one says, uh, think of a, this is really fanciful, very much like A.J. Edgar Hoover, we can't see the enemy. We know it's there, and it's scaring, it's scaring us to death. Think of the goalie at a soccer game, a football game, uh, who must sh uh, stop every shot for the enemy wins if it scores a single goal. The problem is you can't see the ball. Uh, it is invisible, and so are the players. Uh, he doesn't know how many there are or where they are or what they look like. Um, and this is basically the key thing. The want of actionable intelligence with a knowledge, uh, combined with the knowledge of what might happen produced an aggressive, panicked attitude that assumed the worst about threats. Now, what you do is, he, if the one hypothesis would be, going back to the Korean War period, you know, when you say, well, the fact that none of these leads lead anywhere might mean there's not anything out there. 
Uh, that fits the evidence just as well as the fact that we, there's a lot of things out there and we just simply can't see them. The director of the FBI was saying things at that time, in, the, in mid, about 2006, what really bothers me is the things we're not seeing. I mean, it's just sort of spooky kind of stuff. Uh, we still haven't seen anything. Um, and ultimately, this came down to basically an existential threat. Um, we're still getting this. Uh, just last year, however, uh, Joseph Biden said, we face no existential threat none to our way of life or ultimate security. And this earlier this year, Obama said, I do not consider an existential threat. I insist we maintain a proper perspective and we do not provide a victory to terrorist networks, etc." Now, what's happened is the idea that terrorism presents an existential threat, namely that it will cease, the whole world, or certainly the whole developed world, will cease to exist because of terrorists in Afghanistan, strikes me as being totally preposterous. But it's taken 10 years, 11, uh, 15 years practically, for someone to actually say that. It seems it worked. In other words, people are not saying Obama's a coward or something. However, uh, you get the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency saying, the terrorist enemy is committed to the destruction of freedom and the American way of life while seeking world domination achieved through violence and bloodshed. Um, my my co-author, Mark Stewart, who is an Australian, is as we speak at a conference in Canberra, and he just got an email this morning, and he said that the, uh, the Australian head of essentially the FBI or CIA, the director of the ASIO, um, uh, just gave a speech in, at this conference where he said, we face an existential threat. The terrorists are gonna cause Australia to top, stop existing. So where are we gonna get our kangaroos? We're in big trouble. Um, and, uh, but it just sort of, you know, it's so blazingly obvious, to me at least, and you may want to argue that, that the threat is not existential. It, it, it's not even clear what it means, existential, that we'll cease to exist somewhere. Uh, Michael Chertoff, the head of the um, Department of Homeland Security, said not only is it an existential threat, but it's a significant existential threat, as opposed to an insignificant existential threat. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's it, uh, just uh, mind-boggling. Um, and uh, the uh, Flynn said, according to the report, his remarks to an audience of special operators and intelligence officers evoked many nods of approval, occasional cheers, and ultimately a standing ovation. So, so it's still there, uh, even this my time after. Okay, one place this has been focused on is on nuclear terrorism. I want to talk about just a little bit about that. Um, I did a whole book called Atomic Obsession dealing with that issue. Um, but it gives you some sort of the idea. This is uh, Robert Mueller, the head of the director of the FBI, and a guy talking to him. It says, there are dark circles under his heavy-lidded brown eyes when he utters the word nuclear device. He knits his brow and clenches his teeth. At one point, he is discussing the possibility of a nuclear threat from terrorists, and anxious thought lifts his left eyebrow like an arrow poised in mid-flight. Um, so he's really scared. And then Ralph um, Moat Larson, who's now at, um, um, at Harvard, was a CIA investigator at the time. Someone talks to him, and he says, he knows most surely with each passing minute that we are blind without moles, that Al-Qaeda is looking for uranium. There's plenty of it out there. With as little as 35 pounds, the sophisticated group could build a Hiroshima the size bomb. We'd never see it coming. That's why he can't sleep. He's growing grim, sepulchral, and he hasn't touched his corn muffin. <laughs> no. So that's, that's the kind of mentality that's basically been running the, the situation. And what that means is throwing tons and tons of money at the problem. Uh, since 9-11, the, uh, the, uh, Mark and I estimate, the amount of money being thrown at the terrorism problem within the United States is over a trillion dollars, in uh, current trillion dollars. Um, Graham Allison at Harvard was saying more than 10 years ago, is my considered judgment on the current path a nuclear terrorist attack on America in the decade ahead is more likely than not. As far as I know, they didn't hold a celebration in 2014 to say, well, Graham, you're wrong. Um, he's still out there doing it. Um, and basically, if I may summarize a somewhat complicated argument fairly quickly, um, it's extremely difficult for terrorists to get nuclear weapons. I'd be glad to talk about this more later if you want, obviously. Uh, someone is unlikely to give them a bomb because they won't be able to control it. If they steal a bomb, it's going to have all kinds of uh, safety devices. The Pakistanis keep their bombs in pieces, so you have to steal both bombs and know how to put them together and know how to get the safety devices off. Uh, no one thinks they can make a bomb from scratch. Um, and the idea of making a bomb with stolen pro purloined materials is also extraordinarily difficult because you have to go through so many complicated 
many technical things. But the idea came out of 9-11 is that if they're so good with box cutters, they must really be also good with nuclear technology. It did not follow. Um, but anyway, that's been sort of a major thing. Uh, let me, on some of the side issue, is talk about something else, which is nuclear proliferation, uh, which uh, terrorism figures in that in some respects as, all, as well. Uh, but uh, John Kennedy in 1963 uh, said he was haunted by the feeling that by 1970 uh, there would be 10 nuclear powers instead of four, by 75, 15, or 20, and, and more and more and so on uh, going out. Um, this is the list of the countries. Norway, as you can see, was supposed to be one of the uh, places that was going to get a nuclear weapon. And it turned out that hardly any of them did. And the ones that did get it, two or three at least, were already known to be working, working on it assiduously. Um, uh, and Kennedy also said a, a Chinese nuclear test is likely to be historically the most significant and worst event of the 1960s. John McCone, director of the, of the CIA at the time, was saying unless the Chinese threat is met with a much wider uh, strength in the Western alliance, nuclear war is almost inevitable. Now, it turned out that the historically the most significant and worst event of the 1960s was John Kennedy's decision to stop the Chinese by sending troops into South Vietnam. It had nothing to do with the weapons. Um, and in fact, the consequences of nuclear proliferation, proliferation have been substantially benign. Nobody talks about that. They got, basically say, if anybody gets nuclear weapons, it's a real disaster. In fact, I can give you an example right here, Mohammed Bar Baraday still. We are reaching a point today where I think Kennedy's prediction, even though it's been totally wrong for, a, for half a century, um, is very much alive. Either we're going to move toward nuclear armor, we're going to have 20 or 30 uh, countries with the weapons, and that's the end of civilization. Um, but if you, uh, but what happens is nuclear weapons have proliferated a little bit, and they proliferated to really crazy people. For example, uh, Joseph Stalin got it in 1949, and he's working there. He's trying to change the climate of the Soviet Union by bu placing, uh, building a lot of trees. And so he's looking at a map of where all his trees are going to be to change it. Mao Zedong got it in 1964. And just before that, he had launched the Great Leap Forward, which resulted in the starvation deaths of 45 million Chinese people, um, also totally crazy in a lot of ways. And what have they done with the weapons? Nobody's done anything with the weapons except to stoke their national ego, feel good about it, think how powerful they are, uh, and dirt, to try to deter real or imagined threats. So the, the effects have been very limited. Most countries haven't even got them because it's just a big waste of time and money uh, and, and scientific expertise. Uh, but the efforts to stop nuclear proliferation are shown, for example, in the war in, um, in Iraq, which is an anti-proliferation war. Hundreds of thousands of people, certainly 100,000 people, have died in that war that was designed to keep them from getting nuclear weapons, which they almost certainly would not have used, it seems to me. Okay, uh, past Baraday. Okay, let me talk about um, just two other items now. One is the argument that our efforts have deterred terrorism and deterred, uh, also is used during the Cold War. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, there's basically three arguments. Okay, that's true. There hasn't been another 9-11. There hasn't been anything even remotely close to 9-11. Uh, and the reason is because we prevent it from happening. So I'd like to deal with that argument. One, we are trying to keep them attacking. They haven't attacked. Therefore, it must be our efforts that have kept them from attacking. So let me give you uh, sort of uh, uh, four arguments against that. Uh, one is that uh, the frequency of, of terrorist attacks has not really changed very much before and after 9-11, uh, particularly in the developed world, and the amount of damage that's done is very small, uh, by and large. Uh, the, an American, if you're an American, your chance of being killed by a, um, a terrorist is about one in four million per year. If you only deal with the period since 9-11, it's about one in 110 million. No one talks about that, but they really should. Um, in many respects, and this is kind of a preo issue, um, it's a matter of definition in some respects. Uh, this is from one of the top um, uh, compilations of data uh, of a terrorist attacks. And notice how they're defining uh, terrorism. It's the threatened or actual use of illegal force and violence by non-state actors to attain a political, economic, religious, or social goal through fear, coercion, or intimidation. It doesn't say it could be either civilian or military targets. Uh, the problem is, with, if you use a definition like that, um, is that uh, any civil war 
becomes, uh, in fact, any war, but certainly any civil war, uh, becomes the uh, actual use of illegal force and violence by non-state actors, in other words, rebels, uh, uh, um, insurgents, uh, to attain a goal, namely take over the government or change something else or to secede and so forth. So what's happened is, because using definitions like that, virtually all civil wars are essentially acts of terrorism. So we've massively expanded the definition of terrorism, but if anything, civil wars are less frequent than they have been before 9-11. Um, and, but, they, but the number, the consequences in places where they are going on are, has been severe. For example, uh, Assad was just, argue, was just interviewed about three months ago on, in, on, on television, uh, and his basic argument is anybody that's against me is a terrorist. And that definition is, you know, any insurgent, what people used to call insurgents in civil wars are now uh, terrorists. Uh, the United States is more selective. It says that ISIS is a terrorist organization despite the fact that it controls territory, fights pitched battles against armed soldiers, and tries to have a society of sorts in the area it controls. Not, but the other people fighting Assad, not ISIS, are not terrorists. They are instead of various kind, other kinds of insurgents or, or opponents. Uh, so people use the definition however they want, but uh, much of the counting of terrorism, and, and you, have to, you have to get out of war zones essentially, suggests that uh, it's a very rare and limited uh, phenomenon. Um, okay, the uh, a second argument, um, so in many respects it's not clear that terrorism has increased, though if you define it that way, it's really increased, but then you have to go back and redefine all civil wars throughout history. For example, the huge civil war that took place in Algeria in the 1990s, 100,000 people died. Uh, that it was called a civil war, and you had the insurgents against the government, uh, but it was called a civil war. It wasn't called acts of terrorism, but they were they were doing what that definition says is terrorism. Uh, the second area in which the, the they argue that uh, deterrence has worked is that it's, it's it seems to be the case that certain targets are no longer um, 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 uh, possible to really attack. For example, airlines and military bases. And I think I basically agree with that. It's, being, it's, got, it's so difficult to attack an airliner now that, it, that you could argue that terrorists would be really foolish to even try, and they certainly haven't. Uh, the problem is, however, is that just because you can't get on, blow up an airliner, uh, you have to find another target, and there's an infinite number of targets. So the argument, in some respects, the deterrence argument, is that because we defined, uh, be, it kept them from being able to take down airplanes, they've given up completely. Well, what kind of a terrorist says, well, I want to be terrorist, uh, and I want to take down an airliner. And they say, well, it's impossible to take down an airliner. They say, okay, then I'm not going to be a terrorist. I mean, not a very dedicated terrorist, it seems to me. Uh, if they want to find something to blow up, um, like, say, doing a shooting like at Mumbai, or, or at, at Kenya, for example, in the shopping center, not a very complicated technical task. They can certainly get tons of publicity or whatever they're trying to do. Uh, so it seems to me that basically that's uh, another argument that doesn't work. Um, a third argument is that it assumes that terrorists are capable of doing much of anything. And let me give you a bit of evidence on that uh, score. Uh, this is the national uh, a, a official report from the Department of Homeland Security from 2009. Um, about uh, protecting national infrastructure in the United States. And it's got a section about the enemy, the, the adversary. Um, and it says this, the enemy is relentless, patient, opportunistic, and flexible. It shows, shows an understanding of the potential consequences of carefully planned attacks on the economy, on economic transportation and symbolic targets, seriously threatens national security, and could inflict mass casualties, weaken the economy, and damage public morale and confidence. And that's it. If the next line says, however, most of them are knuckleheads, it would at least be balanced. But they never say that. And the evidence is basically knuckleheads win. Um, I've done a study of uh, basically a case study book, which is available online, uh, free, uh, of all the terrorism cases in the United States of people, whether they're in the United States or abroad, who are planning, who are thinking, in some respects, about attacking the United States. Um, so it's, uh, um, it does not deal with people going overseas to attack Americans or anything else there, but it's basically uh, within the United, uh, going to attack the United States. And when uh, my uh, honor students and others have done the case studies, I asked them to explain what the terrorist capabilities are. Uh, are there words like 
patient, relentless, opportunistic, and flexible, those kinds of words. Uh, overwhelmingly, the words I got are like this. Not exactly a, 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 a threat to the eternal uh, existence of the human race. Brian Jenkins, a top researcher at Rand Corporation, says their numbers remain small, not even 30, 331. Uh, their determination limp and their competence poor. That's what the enemy looks like, but almost no one in the administration basically seems to uh, look, at it, look at it that way. Um, and in many respects, is also from the book, um, it's about dueling delusions. A Muslim hothead has delusions about changing the world by blowing something up, and the authorities have delusions that he might actually be able to overcome his patent inadequacies, inadequacies to do so. It basically isn't happening. Um, okay, and finally, uh, me, on this issue about deterrence, is the, the cost-benefit analysis. Let me give you this thing we've done quite a bit, and I'll just sketch the argument. I think you'd be able to follow it pretty well. A uh, cost-benefit analysis basically deals with four variables. Um, you can make it more complicated, but this is pretty, pretty adequate. Uh, the question is, the benefit is the, th the first three things multiplied together. The probability of successful attack, what's the likelihood that attack could be carried out, how bad would the attack be? Would it be blowing up Times Square? Would it be you know, throwing a rock through a window? Uh, and then the, the reduction in risk caused by the security measure. So you multiply those three together, and that's the benefit. Then there's uh, against that, that's the benefit, you have to compare it with the cost, and so you compare that to the cost of the security measure. Now there's a technique which is very common in risk analysis called break-even analysis. And the issue is basically is to put the th top three things and equate them to cost. In other words, at what point does the benefit equal the cost? It's sort of a good benchmark thing to sort of figure out are we, are we spending money for the right things. Now what it makes it possible to do, using that second equa that equation there, is to, uh, instead of figuring out what the probability of a terrorist attack is, what you do is you try to figure out how many attacks there'd have to be to justify the security expenditure. So you basically do this, just a quick algebra. So you, you, the probability is the thing you're looking for. Now the things on the right of the equal sign, the cost of the security measure, for example, having extra guards at the, um, at the airports, uh, putting up uh, barriers so a truck can't get close enough a, a, with a bomb and so forth, uh, is fairly easy to calculate, pretty much, what the security measure would do. The security measure tries to either reduce the probability of the attack, for example, by catching terrorists before they get there, or to re reduce the consequence of the attack by, uh, for example, not letting a truck get close enough to a building to do a whole lot of damage. Um, the, uh, the other effect, then the, the second thing on the right is the losses after the cost, and you can, you can basically say, well, what kind of attack would there be? Let's talk about Times Square attacks. Uh, let's talk about the Boston Marathon attacks. How many of those kinds of attacks? And the risk reduction, um, how much does the uh, security measure basically reduce the risk? Uh, we basically just sort of let it say, well, let's say it reduces it all virtually, or 80%, 90%, 100%, something like that. Um, so we just say, okay, the security measure is extremely effective. And then the question is, how many attacks, assuming the security measure is extremely effective, would this security measure have to um, uh, uh, prevent? Um, the, uh, we do this with a whole bunch of things, but let me just give you one example. Uh, since 9-11, since I actually misspoke a little bit before, since 9-11, the increase of expenditures in the United States has been a trillion dollars, about $75 billion a year, and that's a low estimate. So the question is, we had security measures before 9-11, and now we added about a trillion dollars worth over a decade plus uh, to these measures. That's not only the Department of Homeland Security, that's FBI, that's uh, uh, protecting American bases within the country, but it's not dealing with anything abroad, not the, the war in Iraq or anything else. Um, and so uh, basically what we're uh, uh, trying to do is estimate do this increase of security measures of about a trillion dollars, about $75 billion a year, how many attacks would that have to prevent, uh, deter, or protect against uh, to justify its expenditure using that equation? Okay, let's, uh, let's use for an example a Boston-type attack. How many Boston Marathon-type attacks would they have to have prevented, uh, um, deterred, or um, protected against? to justify the expenditure. And it comes out to be about three every single week. 
So if you really think these expenditures have actually uh, prevented three attacks every single week since 9-11, then they are cost effective. You think that's pretty unlikely, they are not. Another, another example would be uh, a uh, attack, the, the worst attack, the, the biggest, the, the most recent big attack uh, by Muslim extremists in the West, uh, which was the, the London bombing of 2005 already, uh, 10 years ago, um, and uh, that which cost maybe a half a, a half a billion dollars in damage. There's ways, there's ways of calculating that are fairly, fairly straightforward. Uh, the question is how many London style attacks, a really, really bad attack, would there have to have been, have been prevented by these measures to justify their cost? And it comes out to be about one every month. If you, if you could demonstrate that these measures have, these in, increase of expenditures have prevented one London style attack, a big, really big attack and horrible obviously, every single month, then they begin to be cost effective. Um, so this is the, the basic argument we use in terms of trying to deal with the deterrence thing. Okay, my, um, and it, it, something like this also happened during the Cold War. Uh, um, Dwight Eisenhower seems to have been one of the people who basically was able to look at this sort of anew. Um, he said this pathetic thing about we are piling up armaments because we don't know what else to do. Uh, it's pretty clear, this is Eisenhower on the top, he was concerned about a sort of peaceful infiltration by the, by the communists. Uh, but after many long years of study of this problem, every, everything is pointing to the fact that Russia is, is, uh, is uh, should be, is not seeking a general war and will, and will not for a long, long time, if ever. And I've been working on this particularly in the last few weeks, and there's a, tons of reason to think Eisenhower is extremely sincere about this, and he said it repeatedly. In other words, what he was saying was, they, we don't need to deter them because they're not going to start a big war. We have to worry about things like infiltration, sabotage, you know, set like that, uh, uh, subverting uh, friendly countries and so forth. But we don't have to, they're not going to start another general war. I've seen these guys, I've talked to them. In Munich, I talked to Stalin. These guys are not going to start a war. And he was basically right about that, as I was saying at the beginning. Uh, but he never had the courage to say that in public. So in his famous uh, statement about uh, the military industrial complex, what he did was talk about the military industrial complex spending tons of money on weapons we don't necessarily need. But he never attacked the premise, which was this, the Soviets are about to start World War III. Uh, he never had the political courage to do that overall. Uh, George Kennan, as you can see, another thinker, said something somewhat similar. Okay, finally. Uh, the question is, um, I've tried to argue there's been an awful lot of unjustified alarm, and I try to even put some numbers on it a little bit, give you some idea of where we've been going on this. But the question, can it fade? And the, the uh, communist comparison is going to be useful. Um, this is a statement by an anthropologist, which I like about Scott Atran. Perhaps never in history of human conflict, uh, it's, it's sort of the Churchill thing about not, uh, uh, so many people owed so much to so few. Perhaps never in the history of human conflict have so few people with so few actual means and capabilities frightened so many. And uh, one of the chapters in the book deals with public opinion. I'll give you just a sketch of some of the issues there. This is a little bit confusing maybe, but I think I can make it clear. This is the first the question at the top. This is the United States, of course. I'd really like to get data on this in Europe and so forth. So if anybody knows about that, let me know. Um, how worried are you that uh, you or someone in your family have become a victim of terrorism? Very worried, somewhat worried, not too worried, or not worried at all. Uh, I like the question because it's sort of personal, it's clear, you know, it's not confusing in many respects. And the question is, how worried are you? Well, if your chance of being killed by a terrorist is one in four million or one in 110 million, your answer should be, I'm not worried at all. It's crazy to worry about something with that low probability. Uh, but people do. And we also, this also gives you a sort of sense, because it, it goes back before 9-11 of some other things. On the extreme left, he has the bombing in Oklahoma City in 1995. It's sort of our, uh, our um, uh, uh, attack like the Norwegian one in many respects. A, a bomb was set off uh, at, in Oklahoma City killing over 100 people by Timothy McVeigh. Um, and that's when they start asking the question. So it's a good sort of pre-9-11 benchmark. As you can see, when they asked it in 1995, uh, the... Um, uh, the uh, percentage of people saying that they were afraid was about 42%. You can also see after that, so between the two lines, between the OK City line and the 9-11 line, that there was a pronounced decline. Uh, 
uh, and it probably would have continued on if uh, onward. So what happened was it, at that time is about 40 percent or so. Uh, so it gives a sort of a feel for the way people listen, think about this question. They were scared after Oklahoma City. Um, and uh, it's sort of like the Breivik thing. If this could happen here, why couldn't it happen in Oslo or a million other places? And after a while, it's pretty clear that it's not going to be repeated and people become more relaxed about it. So that's sort of tapped there. Okay, then what happens at 9-11 is uh, they, there's a whole bunch of questions sort of jammed together there, so it gets a little clumsy. But it goes up to about 60%. In fact, it goes even a little bit higher. The highest was actually not only after 9-11, but also after the anthrax attacks that took place a few weeks later um, in, in the United States. It goes up to 60%. But then by the end of the year, by the end of 2001, it's bas basically back to where it was for Timothy McVeigh, about 40%. And as you can see, it's jumped around a lot. But as of now, it's the same place it was at the end of 2001. 40%. In other words, unlike Timothy McVeigh, it didn't decline. It stayed at very much the same place. I, I'll, I'm going to talk about ISIS a bit, a little bit uh, later. But as you can see, the, uh, it's, it's essentially higher now. This, this last X here is uh, the worry from just last June, a couple of months ago. Uh, and it's as higher than it's ever been um, virtually since 9-11. Uh, the spikes up are various things. For example, the fear went up at the beginning of the Iraq war because the fear was that if we attack Iraq, Saddam Hussein has all these terrorists under his control and they're going to erupt in terrorism. That proved to say, be the least uh, not true. And when, the second thing there the, the, with the X on it uh, is when Saddam Hussein was captured and the fear went down, but it bounced back into the 40% range. So quite, I mean, this is quite surprising to me that there hasn't been an erosion because we've had none of those 9-11 attacks. There haven't been any more big attacks like 9-11. Uh, there haven't been any, um, uh, there, there haven't been uh, any attacks at all in the United States of any real magnitude. Uh, they've been very sporadic. Um, and there, uh, there's been no major attack in the Western world by Islamist extremists since 2005. In addition, bin Laden has been captured. So you think people will be starting to relax as they did after the McVeigh case, but they haven't. It's still there uh, holding up. Um, this is the other, another question I'd like to deal with. This, this one didn't decline at all. It goes back to 9-11. The question is, how likely, this is also a pretty good, clear question, how likely do you think it is that another terrorist attack causing large numbers of American lives to be lost will happen in the near future? Very likely, somewhat likely, not very likely, or not likely at all. Um, as, at 9-11, about 70% of the people thought that there, that there, would, there, there was likely, somewhat or very likely, uh, that there would be an attack. And as you can see, the last time the question was asked in, in 2013, it was still the same. Uh, there had been some ups and downs and so forth and some other changes and so forth. The percentage of people saying it's not at all unlikely, not at all likely, hasn't changed at all. It's still about 5%, um, even though there haven't been any attacks and so forth. Um, Okay, there's, um, and this is a question about how, do you feel safer if people, any, people generally feel less safe than they did earlier in, this, in the, a few years ago, particularly after the ISIS thing, as you can see at the very end there. Um, okay, uh, I, I talked about domestic communists earlier in the United States and how much fear there was of them and how invisible they seemed in a lot of ways. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is sort of look at that because we have some data on that, which is uh, pretty interesting, it seems to me. Uh, first of all, the, uh, let's see, was this supposed to be, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the red line is, as you can see, the number of uh, uh, items in the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature uh, dealing with Communism U.S. or Communist Party U.S. And what you can see in the so-called McCarthy period in the 1950s, there was a huge number of these. Um, in, in, in this you know, a consistently uh, registered uh, journal uh, is very high, so people were very concerned about domestic communists. Then, because there was, and there was spectacular cases and so forth, then basically it faded away. Um, uh, and by the time you get to the 1970s, there were virtually no articles in the press about communism in the United States. Uh, but the blue line is a percentage, it should be on a different scale, but it'll work. The blue line is a percentage of people holding U.S. communists to be a great or very great danger. In 1954, about 40% said they're a great or very great danger. By the, uh, 10 years later, 
It had gone down only a little bit, and even 20 years later, despite the fact that there was nothing in the press, it had only gone down to about 30%. So it lost 25% of its value from 30, 40% down to 30%, but it was still there. Um, this sort of suggests a comparison between domestic communists and terrorists. I think the comparison is that domestic communists were afraid, were feared, because they're connected to some sort of spooky international conspiracy based in Moscow or maybe in Beijing. So I think that basically, can, can, even though there wasn't much, there wasn't any cases of, of, of uh, sabotage or espionage after the after uh, the fifties, or really after World War II in many respects, um, and so consequently it was kind of a spooky thing out there. Um, and uh, the same thing would I think hold for terrorism. In other words, the thing that's that's scary about Al Qaeda type terrorists is they're connected to this international movement. Now, in the, however, in the case of communism. We don't have any data later than that, but I assume that the question, they don't even ask the question anymore because it's so silly. But at the end of the Cold War, communism could actually die. But, but the problem with terrorism, it can't die. There can always be terrorists. There can always be spooky little groups someplace, somewhere. Uh, and, it may, and also, in the case of terrorism, there's the constant little pinpricks of, of uh, plots that are picked up in various places, uh, and sometimes quite large cases, such as the uh, uh, situation in Paris. Okay, let me conclude with um, the uh, ISIS issue, because that's the current devil du jour in many respects, um, in, in a space. Um, this is, again, American opinion, but I've actually been talking to a Czech researcher um, who says that th these numbers are very similar for Ch the Czech Republic. The difference between the Czech Republic and the United States is the United States has lots of Muslims. The Czech has about three, the Czech Republic has like three Muslims in the whole country. Uh, you know, it's not exactly, a th and there's never been a terrorist attack by Muslim, Muslim extremists in, in, in Czech Republic. Nonetheless, they're very worried about it, and it's probably the case in much of Western, uh, Western Europe as well, including Norway. Um, what happened was that, um, in this case, the, well, I guess I, uh, after, uh, you remember Mosul, uh, which is when the ISIS came into action. They, they took over Mosul, and the Iraqi, this is in 2013, 2014, only a year ago, um, that, uh, and the Iraqi forces just fell apart. Uh, a question was asked in response to recent violence in Iraq, the top one, do you favor or oppose the United sending, sending ground troops into Iraq? And uh, the, the uh, percentage was very low, about less than 20%, I think, um, there. Now, what happened was that this escalated, the red, this is the red line, uh, uh, the red diamonds. It escalated when there were the beheadings and then also a big spike up after the Caleb Mueller death last um, February but then backed out. So what you've had is this huge increase of concern about ISIS after a few beheadings, not after the fact that they took over Mosul, not after the fact that they'd killed all kinds of Iraqi soldiers and so forth, uh, prisoners, but after the, those few deaths. And also what you find is that ISIS, a large number of people think that ISIS is a major security threat. Um, the, it seems to me that it basically isn't. It's a, it's a security threat if you're living in the Middle East, and this is probably something we want to talk about more later. Um, but the, it seems to me that um, ISIS, um, for the first place, it doesn't see the far enemy. The far enemy for uh, Osama bin Laden and, our, and uh, the theory they're working under is that the only way we can get the United States and the Brits and so forth out of the Middle East is to attack them at home, the far enemy. Then if we attack them there, they'll pull out. And Osama bin Laden was continuing to believe that to, to his, the day of his death. Uh, ISIS doesn't believe that. They want to set up the caliphate in the Middle East. They, they're not particularly interested ideologically in attacking the West, except in uh, making things difficult for people who are attacking them. Um, it's also the case that people are worried, and certainly in Europe, I know, about um, returnees, people who go to ISIS and then learn how to become a terrorist and then come back. There's a really good study out of Brookings, and there's also some Norwegian uh, studies of this in the past, uh, the study in Brookings by uh, Daniel Byman and um, Jeffrey Shapiro, Jeremy Shapiro, um, arguing that returnees basically don't do very much. For, for the first place, they mostly don't return. What they do is they get killed, 
or they're, they're going to suicide missions. Um, and uh, that's happening a lot uh, currently. Um, and if they do return, they mostly are very disillusioned and so forth, and they basically don't turn to terrorism. Furthermore, a few cases where they have turned to terrorism, they've been very bad at it. They're not trained to be terrorists, they're trained to be combatants. So the training hasn't done them much good. Furthermore, if you look at the ISIS videos, what they do is they show the foreign fighters burning their passports as a way of demonstrating their total cause, uh, the commitment to the, to the ISIS situation in the Middle East. So consequently, the issue, if you really want these guys to go back and commit terror, it's really stupid to have them burn their, 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 um, their, their, their passports. Um, so it's not clear that the people are going to come back. The other, the other thing is that people are worried that it will be an inspiration to terrorists, and there's a few cases where that seems to have been the case, but these have been mostly, you know, knuckle-headed and very limited, uh, limited effects. So while I do certainly think ISIS is a, is a problem in the Middle East, a big problem, a big humanitarian problem, it's not at all clear that Americans or Norwegians or Czechs should think it's a major security threat to them. So uh, that's sort of my, this is my final conclusion here. The grand mistake of the Cold War was to infer desperate intent from apparent capacity. The Soviet Union had a lot of capacity, but it didn't have any intent to do so, but we assumed that. In the case of terrorism, it's the reverse. Although there are some terrorists who are very desperate to do damage, their capacity, uh, they have the intent, but they don't have the capacity. So let me end on that. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Don. Yes, please. Um you, you can come here. Okay. Uh, I would like to have you here, actually, yeah. for uh, a little debate. I'd also like to uh, thank you for uh, inspiring us without tap dancing, uh, <laughs> right. challenging us, perhaps also provoking uh, quite a few of us. Uh, but that is food for debate, and uh, we will have a little debate here, and I'm sure the debate will continue into the reception, not the least because several of your uh, references in your talk will be present here, <laughs> so I'm sure you'll have interesting discussions. Uh, I'd also like to invite onto stage Osne Seierstad. Please, Osne. Many of you know Osne. She is uh, a journalist and uh, an author. Uh, her last book, which was widely acclaimed by uh, the New York Times, uh, amongst others, is called One of Us, and was uh, an account of uh, how the uh, Norwegian terrorist, Anders Bering Breivik, came uh, into being. She um, is a war reporter who's been covering uh, uh, wars in the Balkans, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and uh, elsewhere. Uh, more recently, the uh, what used to be called the Arab Spring. So uh, she has uh, different experiences to draw on. And uh, I'd be curious to know, Osne, what it is that you take away from uh, John's account here. It's obviously rich. There are many themes to pick up on. So I'm not, I'm not asking you to uh, comment on everything that was said. Uh, pick the theme that, uh, that really captures you and uh, that resonates with, uh, with what you've been occupied with in your work recently. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, there is, as you said, lots of themes to discuss, uh, and I think basically the main question for me, uh, after first reading um, you and then listening to you, is what kind of society do we want? Uh, and one thing is whether alar alar alarmism <laughs> that you're talking about uh, is it not leading to anything or is it also counterproductive when it comes to what kind of society do we want? Uh, and what I'm working on as a journalist, it's uh, uh, people, not the big lines, uh, but people, everyday lives. And what was also very interesting was when you go through history and you see all the mistakes that's been done and all the misbelief or disbeliefs and, and uh, exaggerations and, and fear mongering that's been happening, whether it's towards communists in the US uh, or towards Russia or then uh, vice versa towards the Americans in Russia. Uh, is it different today? What makes it different today? Why should we today uh, trust the authorities, trust those who try to fear us? Uh, or scare us. Uh, and um, why I think that's important to discuss is um, 
uh, when I'm talking to uh, people on the ground, uh, because I'm now working on um, uh, a new book, which is uh, also about radicalization, but it's about, about the radicalization of the Muslim youth in Europe. Uh, and um, many of them are, basically all of them are mentioning uh, that Europeans don't like Muslims, that we're against them, uh, and that uh, there's, um, there's, uh, uh, there's a mistrust against them as a group. I don't say that relate to all Muslims, but those Muslims who decide to go on the path of whether it's jihadism or whether it's going to join ISIS to become a housewife there or what, whatever it is, they put it in that, that bag. Uh, and I wonder whether alar alarmism uh, in that context is counterproductive. It actually creates uh, possibly uh, also uh, people going on the path uh, towards those groups. And another point uh, which is important to discuss is, the, is our role, the role of the media. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, well, there's lots of different journalists, there are many journalists working on the ground and doing great research. A problem today, of course, is that there are no journalists in Syria, for instance, to really know what is the intentions of, of ISIS. Uh, but when it comes to, um, um, I just today read a study of uh, Thomas Hegamid about those, uh, uh, it, it, what is the threat of, uh, of, um, uh, of, ter of terror in, in, uh, at home uh, when it comes to those going. Uh, and there uh, he says that uh, according to most scholars, uh, it's, it's very, you know, we all know that the ISIS project, just as you say, is very local. But in the media, in the media, there's so many, uh, you know, any little threat, uh, and it's scaring, it's definitely scaring the public. And uh, as we will be uh, hosted later at a reception by the, um, the chief of the PST, the Police Security, uh, Police Security Agency, uh, uh, there was this story last summer of um, middle of summer holiday when, when we heard about um, uh, terrorists on the way to Norway. Uh, and uh, there was a big, uh, of course, uh, very scared population. There was a big football cup. Uh, some teams didn't go uh, uh, because of, they were afraid of coming to Oslo. Uh, and then I'm wondering, what is the point of scaring the population? Uh, because that can also be counterproductive in the order of creating tensions uh, that um, that people are, will be looking for terrorists everywhere, just as they were looking for communists everywhere in the US. So that is also an interesting uh, debate to have, whether that prevented the terrorists from coming because it was in the media, or whether uh, that uh, was actually on the other, uh, on another basis, counterproductive, uh, because we are dealing with um, people and uh, and also not forget you know emotions and what creates uh, what makes you become a, a terrorist and, and uh, I will end on that now but I if there's time I, I would also let go uh, on one theme with which is uh, about growing up and it's about childhood and and you know what creates what kind of people uh, will become terrorists. It's not only about being inspired by what's happening today, but it's, it's uh, maybe there's other things in this society we can do to prevent terrorism than only enforce the police, enforce alarms, and so on. Thanks, Osne. We'll <laughs> certainly get back to the growing up part. Because we'll and one question, if I may, right. um, you may. because Absolutely. I know you will uh, ask question is, one big question when I sit and listen to you now uh, that I didn't think of when I was reading is like, okay, who needs the alarmism? Why do we have it? Why did we have this up through all this century? Who needs it? Who creates it? I don't understand. Uh, like, wh why has, how, how, is it such, um, um, why does it exist? Uh, who benefits? Who's benefiting on it? Uh, from the terrorism itself? No, no, alarmism. Oh. The, the, source, the sources of alarmism, I guess. So these are some yeah, rather right, tall yeah. questions. Uh, 
What are the sources yeah, of alarmism? What society do we want? Right. Are we creating more terrorists than we killed? Yeah. Quote a countryman of yours. But there, there aren't very many terrorists to begin with, so creating, <laughs> you can. Uh, it just um, the reason I spent so much time talking about public opinion and the fact that in the United States it hasn't declined at all during this period of time. Uh, I, I basically see it as bottom up. In other words, people are really afraid. Uh, for reasons that I keep trying to tell them they shouldn't be. And it's not clear that you can do anything about it. So I that may, think may be fairly hopeless. Essentially, from the media's standpoint, uh, there would certainly benefit in the sense that there's this constant... People are obviously extremely exercised and concerned about ISIS. Therefore, if you can get ISIS into a story, people will read it and buy newspapers and, and watch on television. So I, I don't know how... if it's. I think it's probably the case in Europe as well, but it's certainly the case in the United States, that there'll be some sort of, uh, you know, there's this effort in, um, um, in Garland, Texas, uh, in which there was a cartoon contest, and in which two guys came and tried to shoot up the cartoon contest. They were heavily armed, and they were both killed by a security officer who had nothing but a pistol. Uh, they did no damage except that they were able to shoot another security guard in the ankle. That was the whole effect of their pathetic effort uh, to, to deal with it. But in the news coverage, there's constant efforts to try to connect it to ISIS. And there's a little bit of, you know, some tweeting that had gone on. And I think the reason for that is that they, we, want to make, we want people to read the story, and they'll read it if it's about ISIS. It's not that they'll be concerned about ISIS because we put it in the story. It's the other way around. So um, I've worried about this issue a lot, and it's very hard to predict what people are going to be afraid of and why they would become uh, enamored or, or outraged about certain things. Uh, for example, in the United States, uh, there was the hostage crisis in Iran in 1979, last 444 days, and every night there was coverage about it. Uh, well, it, it looked at objectively, say, this is a trivial event. There are 50 people who were get hostage, an outrage and so forth, but eventually they were let go free. They were never hurt. They were never harmed. Uh, they certainly weren't killed. Um, and it was by a regime that didn't really know what it was doing in Iran in those days. Uh, but nonetheless, this resonated enormously. So every night, there'd be, uh, this is day 73 of the hostage crisis, day 74, day 243 of the hostage crisis. And the reason was that people were interested in finding out about that. Um, and I would not have predicted that. The Gulf War of 1991 was one which uh, really, in the United States, I did a book on this, on the public opinion in the war in the first Gulf War, 91, and there were questions asked just as it was starting, how often do you think about the upcoming Gulf War? And people said, I think about it all the time. They're really concerned. This would be a big, big problem. And it came and obviously not much happened. There was not much of a war. But people can't even remember that event but they can remember the hostage event. So uh, it, it seems basically, if I could predict it perfectly, I'd be in Wall Street and I'd quickly become the richest person in the world because I know what people are gonna fear tomorrow or the day after. Um, and, uh, but it seems mostly at that level. Um, you could say the media is profiting from it because they are playing to the fears of their readers. I do not think really that they're, they're creating it. That's why the uh, public opinion about the communists is interesting. The media actually weren't dealing with communists very much because there wasn't anything to report. There wasn't an attack like the Garland attack, which you know is obviously news. Um, they, they, what, the Autonomous Party was a joke. It wasn't doing anything. It couldn't subvert its way out of a wet paper bag. And so they weren't covering it. Nevertheless, fears continued on. So um, I'm sort of a defender of the medium in one sense and an attacker in the other. Um, in the sense, I don't think they cause it, they may exacerbate it, they certainly play on it, and they certainly find profit in doing so. Uh, but I don't think they create the fear, uh, and uh, they, they're much more likely to find out, what are you afraid of? If you're afraid of that, we're going to cover it. Um, and and uh, reporters will come in and say, you know, we've, we have the situation in eastern Congo in which hundreds of thousands of people have died since 1997. And the editor says, yeah, well, so what? No one's interested in that. And they don't cover it. And they're probably right. You put a story about it, no one will read it. It's not that the government that that, uh, that you're uh, that you're creating the fear. So I think that's why it's sort of hopeless. You know, if, if people were manipulated, it'd be easy because then you could manipulate them into not being so fearful. But you can't. Uh, I'll give you just one quick example. Um, a lot of people are afraid of flying, including my wife. 
uh, and uh, you, can, you can tell them all the, the statistics you want, uh, and they're still afraid of flying. And if you ask some of them, not particularly my wife, why are you afraid of flying? They say it's because they can't control the airplane. I can control a, a car. And you say, well, why do you get into a taxi cab then? Can't control that. Why do you get into a, 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 a tram? Why do you get into a boat? Why do you get into a bus? I don't know, you can't control those either. So it's very hard to know what people are going to actually be afraid of. And the ISIS threat is a good case immediately, because the only, there was no threat, there's been almost no threat to the West. Nevertheless, in the Czech Republic, presumably in Norway, certainly in the United States, is this fear that it's a national security threat. It's obviously a humanitarian disaster. I certainly do not think we should ignore it. But it's, it's basically, it seems to me, it's the, um, uh, it somehow struck a responsive chord. That those beheadings, which are obviously vicious and horrible, cr uh, created this, this, uh, this long-lasting uh, hostility and concern. And, it, and uh, it's perfectly understandable that it might happen, but it's certainly not predictable that it would. So anyway, if you've got the fear going, and it's bottom up, you have officials who also, and politicians who also play on the fear. Um, the, uh, for example, you know, the statistic I gave you, the Americans' chance of being killed by a terrorist is one in four million or one in 100 million, depending how you want to look at it. Uh, you'd think people would say that in newspaper articles. You'd think politicians would say that. And they basically don't, because they're afraid if they say that and something happens and they'll look like fools or something like that, they'll be voted out of office. But it's simple fact. Now, you can tell people that your chance of being killed by a terrorist is one in four million per year, uh, and they will uh, basically, and they, and they may still remain, uh, and, and they have a choice of being afraid. They say, okay, it's only one in four million, I'm still afraid. That's the way they are. Same with people who fear flying. Uh, but it seems to me they should know the number. Uh, in the United States, there's only been one case, one case, I've looked really hard, in which a public official has said basically that one in four million thing. It was uh, Mayor Bloomberg in 2007. He said, get a life, get a life. Your chance of being killed by terrorists is about the same as being killed by lightning. Um, and he said it, and he got reelected two years later. Uh, but they, it's the only time anybody's ever said that. Instead, the question is always, are we safer than we used to be? But the way the discussion should start is, how safe are we? That's where you start. Now, maybe that's not safe enough. That's the next decision. Well, how safe are you? There's ways of measuring it, and it's uh, your chance of being killed by a terrorist is one in four million, five million, a hundred million, and some depending on how you look at it. Um, that it, the question is, is that safe enough? And that question never gets asked. I tried with officials and others, and uh, it simply doesn't work overall. Hmm. Austin, I know that in your work you've been, to my mind, operating with sort of a biographic method. You've been. Uh, interviewing people, or in the Breivik case, trying to understand uh, the trajectory of his life to see what was it that, uh, that, that, that shaped him, that uh, uh, made him into who he was, uh, and what made him do what he did. Uh, and it seems to me you're doing something similar now in your new work on, uh, on uh, young Norwegians who go to Syria to join the fight there. And some of these forces we're talking about, you're talking about the media, John, John is talking about the whole way in which uh, our politicians uh, speak about uh, the threat to terrorism and their reluctance to, in a sense, nuance what it is that it, that is about and place it where it really belongs. Are those factors that you see really in the biographies of these people, are, how, how, how does that, this factor into their upbringing? You mean how they, uh, how and who they become terrorists? Well, uh, this, yes, yeah. yes, you know, these or bigger, fighters. bigger societal factors that we're speaking about here, not only mm. their next door neighbor and what the next door mm. neighbor does, but these larger structural forces. Mm. Well, when you look at, there's, uh, there's a lot of research that have been done on, on those who join terror organization and, uh, and a lot of also recent reports. And, and when it comes to the, on the personal level to start there, it seems that, well, some factors are, um, there's usually a factor of um, feeling alienate, uh, alienated from society, to feel loneliness is a factor, uh, anger is a factor. When you look at families, uh, things like an absent father is a factor. Uh, on the European level, you have fi families that are uh, usually 
uh, a bit below the social, you know, uh, when it comes to income in America, you have actually the, a little bit the opposite. Uh, but that also is a different role of Muslims in, in America and in, in Europe. Uh, and um, very often it's, uh, not always, but it could be uh, growing up in families where you, the parents are not uh, very much integrated uh, into the society. Uh, and uh, there was an interesting film I just saw called Jihad by Dia Khan. And she had made a film about the, uh, a Brit, some British jihadist who had de-radicalized. Uh, and she took away religion. And what, st what is left? She said, when I ask people about religion, when I talk about Islam, when I talk about religion, people are just bored. The audience is bored. So we talked about other things. Mm. And then what, what was back with all these cases was um, I felt different. Uh, I was black. Uh, one was handicapped. It was this feeling of, um, it, it doesn't mean that everyone that is black or handicapped or, or uh, has, has an absent father become terrorist. But if you, you know, if you have some of those factors that makes you not fit in, uh, there, you're more likely. But then it was one of the women who was de-radicalized. What made her de-radicalized? Uh, that was, uh, she had a daughter, and suddenly uh, this, uh, the kindergarten calls her for a meeting, the mother, uh, the very uh, jihadi-oriented mother, uh, and asks her for a talk because the little girl had uh, talked about killing infidels and that, you know, it was good to kill an infidels and she could kill anyone who's not a Muslim. And that moment made the mother realize that she was on the wrong path. So it's society response to her, you know, take her seriously, takes the little girl seri seriously. And that was, you know, uh, instead of uh, maybe calling the police, or instead of making a big thing, it was just the kindergarten, you know, teacher who uh, who made her realize that she was uh, on the wrong path. So there's uh, there's that you know that's the yeah the, the, of course that's a different uh, story, the de-radicalization story. Uh, that's next step of this. Um, but um, what is also uh, interesting is there's an age factor, definitely. Many of these going are very young, down to like 15, 16 years old. Uh, there's very few 40-year-olds going to Syria to fight. Uh, so it's also uh, a, a counter-culture thing, like you protest against your parents, you protest against society, you, you do you know, the worst thing that uh, you could do in, in this society or as a protest. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so what I think is, um, uh, is important here, I haven't mentioned Islam yet, but, but those factors first. And then when you go around, you're a teenager and you have all these feelings that very similar to what a Norwegian teenager could have. But some of these young people, you can, they can put everything into the same basket. It's because I'm a Muslim. It's because I'm a Muslim. It's because I'm a Muslim. Uh, I feel, you know, different. I feel this. I feel that. I feel bad, uh, and that makes them a good target for recruiters, for recruiters who play exactly on these people's want, uh, need to belong somewhere, need to to fit in, to belong, and they create these sisterhoods or brotherhoods depending, uh, and they give them a value and a, a you know, uh, um, uh, self-esteem um, back. So, so it's, uh, that is, yeah, uh, some of the factors. Yeah. Interesting. Can I add on that? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it'd be interesting to do a comparison between the American cases and the uh, European ones, where it may be different, because uh, it is true that Muslims generally uh, on average in the United States are, if anything, above average in terms of economic uh, situation. But when we did the case book uh, studies, I assigned these cases to students, uh, honor students, um, and I gave them an outline. So every case has the same outline. And one of the things, what, what motivated these guys? And I was not surprised qualitatively, but I was surprised quantitatively that overwhelmingly they are radicalized, if that's the word you want to use, by American foreign policy. What really made them angry was their, what was being done to their people 
and their religion, their religious heritage. Many of them are not very religious. Um, you know, they're pork eating, uh, pot smoking um, uh, uh, Muslims um, and uh, uh, hard drinking Muslims. Um, but uh, what motivated them overwhelmingly, not, not in every single case, but overwhelmingly, um, was uh, outrage at Abu Ghraib, the attack on Iraq, the drone attacks in Afghanistan. And they saw it basic as we've got to defend Islam from an attack from the outside, particularly by the Americans and the British, um, and also Israel, uh, as, as basically a European force in, force in, in the Middle East from their standpoint. So um, I was impressed by that because many of them were actually downtrodden. They didn't have very good upbringings. Many of them did not have fathers in the family. Uh, some, quite a few of them were, you know, went to college and so forth. They're fairly well adjusted, but um, uh, a majority probably had, had substantial problems of that sort. They did not fit in very well. But the thing that uh, um, they mostly did not have problems with American society. Most of them had a deep abiding appreciation for American girls, for example. Um, and um, the, uh, so it was not, it was, it was hard to see a real culture clash with, with some important exceptions. Uh, mostly it was foreign policy that was, that was dividing them. I've looked at some of the British cases and I think that's often the, the, the case as well. So it'd be interesting to see if there's a comparison to east and west on that, east of the, yeah, east side, uh, each side of the Atlantic. Hmm. Interesting. You know, John, um, John is writing his book, Osner, that um, uh, in his book Overblown, not the last one, but uh, a former one, that um, if you really want to control terrorism or respond effectively to terrorism, perhaps one of the most effective things you could do is actually to stem the fear that we are producing. Uh, and you were indicating in your initial remark that uh, in some ways the media are instilling that fear. You were also asking who else is it that may have an interest in producing the fear. I uh, don't think John's response really indicates that they think anybody has uh, a clear intent to produce fear, but that that fear is produced nonetheless. But how is it, you, you, all, you also touched upon, you know, what sort of society do we want? And uh, this whole issue of, uh, of fear, you were illustrating it very vividly, I thought, with uh, basically us uh, all watching TV, tracking this uh, lone terrorist on her way to Norway to launch an attack somewhere on uh, civilian here, civilians here. How is it that we can produce a society in which we really learn to live with the threat of terror, you know, place it, in its, place it where it belongs uh, as uh, something that most societies has uh, to some extent had to relate to? Uh, but not overblowing it. Mm. Well, if we should place it where it belongs, I, I tend to agree with uh, John Miller that it's, uh, you know, we should not be afraid then. There's so many other things that we should be afraid of than uh, being run over by a car or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that kind of thing. So, so I don't think most people should be alarmed. Uh, and the story you mentioned about the, the woman, I, I suppose most people almost didn't notice it, it was over Easter. Uh, and it was, I remember hearing on the radio that there uh, on an arcade, there was, there's a suicide, female suicide bomber on her way to Norway or planning to go to Norway. It was kind of a bit of a fluid story. Uh, and it lasted for only one day. And I was thinking how irresponsible of the media because the, it's like, first and foremost, do they want five million Norwegians to look out for some woman who might have a bomb on her skirt? Or it was just like, uh, and, and apparently she was stuck in, in Turkey and, and the TV2 found her the next day. And she said, you know, I just got married in Turkey. So it was an actual person, obviously an Islamist uh, woman but was she on her way to Norway? Was she not? Is this creating fear? And, and it's like, who needs the alarmism? If one should, you know, in a big conspiracy, it's like people who are afraid are easy to rule. Of course, we don't want to think that of Norway. Uh, we, I, it's easier for us, you know, America's a step away, you know, that could believe in that, you know, call it conspiracy or whatever. But is it, uh, is it to, uh, um, you know, Scared people are easier to control. 
Uh, I mean, what other reasons uh, are there? Why, why, is, why is this happening on a government level? It's usually it's, it's coming from the politicians. Hmm. Uh, so it's, uh, but it's um, I, one other thing uh, about um, uh, the radicalization and what we can do. Uh, when, uh, as I mentioned in my first, um, uh, when I started talking about the. I was shocked when I read about the, the childhood of uh, the Kwachi brothers in Paris and the Koulibaly, the, the, the guy who uh, took the kosher shop. And that was after having studied uh, the story of Breivik, where his, uh, as all Norwegians know, his, his childhood is, is a factor. And without that childhood, probably uh, it wouldn't be pers possible for a person to kill 69 people in, you know, in their faces or in their necks as they're fleeing. It's difficult to kill people, uh, research also shows. And then when I read the, about the childhood of the Kuachi brothers, uh, chillingly, uh, it was totally similar to Breivik's childhood. And that was, uh, so it was a lone mother, just like Breivik, growing up in the suburbs of Paris uh, with five children, uh, with some of them with unknown fathers, just as uh, with Breivik's half-sister, unknown father. Uh, she could make, an, make ends meet, so she took to the streets uh, as a prostitute uh, on and off, which were the rumors also about Breivik's mother uh, at some point. Uh, uh, if there, um, uh, this is from neighbor, it's more like there's a, you know, there's a high level of uh, instability in these homes. In both cases, the authorities and psychiatrists wanted to take these kids away from their mothers. Uh, in the Kouachi case, uh, the French authorities, um, because the kids were out at midnight running around, uh, they took three of them uh, into foster care and orphanages. And they left her with two of them, which was Said and Sharif, the two killers. When they were 10 and 12, they came home and the mother had committed suicide. And then we hear, then they get into orphanages and foster care. And then we hear nothing uh, about them until January this year. And we are told they were radicalized by the Muhammad cartoons, by Abu Ghraib, uh, by the war in Iraq. That is the story, the first story. I was like, what made these guys fertile ground for those ideas? What, uh, you know, what, what in them was so destroyed? I'm not blaming the mother. She, uh, as in Breivik's cases, there's, there was deep stories of psychiatry and, and, uh, and disturbances. So it's like you don't blame, uh, I don't want to blame a dis disturbed um, mother. Uh, but, but, and I'm actually not blaming anyone. I'm just pointing at to avoid terror. Uh, when you look at the money being used, uh, on, on, on hard, um, you know, on, on a hard protection against terror, uh, to knit a better society. You know, how all across U Europe now with the crisis, everything spent on youth and children is down, 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 down. Look at UK, it's down by 80% what they spend on youth. It's like, I think that is a big danger when it comes to our societies. And, and I think we should fear, and I don't say they all end up as terrorists, but they, uh, you know, violent criminals. When you look at the research on violent criminals, they all, most of them have, have a bad childhood. They have problems in their past. So it's like, uh, I think to avoid, uh, you know, to, you know, as your question, what makes a better society? Hmm. Uh, use some of that money we used to protect ourselves against terrorism uh, on uh, you know, protecting the most vulnerable among us who might become the most dangerous ones. Uh, I think we should uh, try that. Why couldn't we try that? <laughs> As we go in for a landing, give us one comment yes, on that, a, and then we'll be yeah, winding up. John. In this general discussion, it, it, there's a, it should be kept in mind, there's a problem that uh, social scientists call selection bias. Um, you pick people, basically select on the dependent variable, you pick people who have become terrorists and you find what's similar to them. What you also need is a large number of people who have exactly the same problems. They may, uh, you know, bad upbringing, fatherless family, and they're also outraged by American foreign policy or British foreign policy or Western foreign policy in the Middle East, who do not become terrorists. Uh, it, and so it's a danger to assume that, uh, that either that 
people with bad upbringings become terrorists because a lot of people with bad upbringings have never become, the vast majority never become terrorists, or the people who uh, are opposed to the Iraq war, like me, for example, um, intensely from the beginning and before it even started, uh, but I'm not going to become a terrorist about it. I'm not going to express my views by blowing something up. Uh, and the vast majority, you know, the whole Democratic Party has been basically opposed to the Iraq war after it got going for a while, and uh, none of them became terrorists. So. You have to be careful in the analysis uh, when you're when you're working this way. Sure. No, I think that's a very pertinent reminder, and it's uh, one reason that it may be as important to study those who don't radicalize as those who that's right. radicalize. Yeah. And, 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 the, and also to point out that they they outnumber people who come. And terrorism is extremely mm -hmm. rare. Exactly. Uh, so. But nonetheless, it's food for thought, Osna, that it uh, yeah. happens also, also in Norway, uh, which I think by. Comparative standards is a fairly reasonable society characterized by trust and even trust in authorities, mm -hmm. mind you. Uh, yeah, and I totally agree with the, the last point. I didn't mean to say that, mm -hmm. you know, you're bound to become, but if you are a violent criminal or a terrorist, you're likely to have that kind of past. Just a lot of people who have, are... Of have course, that, of course, right. Yes, right. of course, yeah. Right. This is obviously a discussion that will continue into the late hours. Uh, we have only scratched the surface. We have only touched upon some of the topics in your uh, very rich talk, um, John. Uh, but you have inspired us and you have uh, forced us to think and uh, rethink some of our assumptions, I think most of us. Um, I want to thank you for, uh, for the talk and for this discussion. I want to thank uh, Osne for uh, sharing your uh, thoughts about this. Uh, you have very different perspectives, and I think the dialogue between you is uh, extremely interesting to follow, and I wish we had uh, much more time, uh, but you have certainly enriched our thinking on this phenomena. So thanks a lot. Um, we don't want to leave our guests to leave empty-handed, <laughs> so we uh, have some flowers uh, for both of you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And um, for the main speaker of the year, we also have uh, one out of a rare, rare uh, breed, uh, the Prio uh, <laughs> 50 year anniversary prints, yeah, uh, which is designed by a uh, graphic designer, Norwegian, Trun Nordal, uh, who is a good friend of Prio's, and uh, will probably speak quite pertinently to some of the points that you were making in your uh, talk. Great, thank you. And. Uh, here is a more travel-friendly version. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't look it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you again, uh, John Miller, for your talk. Thank you, Osne, for your uh, comments. We uh, will now move on to uh, the adjacent room, where uh, there will be food and uh, drinks and uh, some entertainment as well as some words from the uh, last speaker of the evening. So please. <laughs>